Detroit Edison oh, built a sodium cool. Sodium is quite volatile. They use not water, but sodium. Huh? What happened was a piece of zirconium, a piece of metal about the size of a beer can, uh, became dislodged in the cooling system, jammed the cooling system. The reactor overheated as a consequence and began to melt. And then radiation alarms were sent off. They immediately stopped the chain reaction. And for days, they were wondering what is the state of a melted core. They had never seen a commercial reactor with a melted core before. And so they simply crossed their fingers. They cr literally crossed their fingers and hoped it wouldn't become supercritical. Uh -huh. It was 20% enriched, highly enriched uranium. Uh, today we use only 3% enriched uranium, by the way. Uh, the bomb is 90% enriched. Could it have gone? It might have gone. There was speculation. That's why they brought, they flew in top flight scientists to try to recreate how much melted fuel there was in that reactor to see whether the melted fuel would combine to give you critical mass. Well, would this, would this uh, fast blast be over dramatic the day we almost lost Detroit, or could it, could it have been that bad? It could have been bad because of two things. One, melting could have started up again, in which case you would have a sodium explosion, which is quite volatile. Sodium will explode uh, on contact with, like, water. Uh, a sodium explosion, which would rip the whole reactor apart, or a small bomb, that is, uh, critical, supercriticality would be attained with melted fuel, and then it would, it would, uh, it would uh, heat up, and then again, another sodium explosion to rip the reactor apart. Um, anyway, what they did was, uh, they got a long tube, a long tube, and they sent it into the reactor with a small TV camera attached to the end of it. They yeah. photographed at the bottom. Right. Um, this is the first time they've ever done this, by the way. This is, everything was by the seat of your pants. I guess. He has never done this before, uh, putting, shooting a TV camera right into the core of a melted reactor. And, uh, you know, there evacu were evacuation plans uh, to evacuate large portions of Detroit. Were they... It was a floating explosion. Were they... Uh, telling the people of Detroit what was going on at the time? They heard nothing. I got the file from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission once years ago. And there was a letter from the union, uh, the United Auto Workers Union, saying that some of the union brothers had heard that there was a massive incident at the reactor. Could you clarify? Yeah. And the answer is also there in the file. The answer is, oh, nothing happened. Oh. And yet we had America's first uh, back in the mid-1960s, uh, a commercial reactor that spun out of control, uh, in which case, Portions of Detroit may have had to be evacuated. Uh huh. And you can visit for me one today, by the way. What, uh, what kind of heat? What kind of heat was developed uh, in in a breeder reactor situation? Well, a breeder reactor is it's called hard nuclear. The hardest of the nuclear reactors are breeder reactors. They operate on very enriched fuel. Um, that's why the, the the Japanese and the uh, French are getting so much criticism because they ship uh, breeder fuel uh, by by uh, ships. Someone could hijack the fuel and conceivably build a small bomb yes. out of the fuel. Yes. The fuel is highly enriched. Like I said, Fermi was 20% enriched. Uh, an atomic bomb is 90% enriched. Commercial reactors are 3% enriched. And so uh, they ship highly enriched uh, plutonium and, react and uranium fuel rods by boat. And so uh, Greenpeace and many environmentalists have stated that this is a, a disaster waiting to happen if someone hijacks a shipment of breeders. Sure. In the United States, it was canceled. Uh, the Clinch River uh, was an experimental beta reactor built after the commercial one melted. Well, uh, how many other, how many breeder reactors operate in the world? Uh, well, in the United States, Clinch River was canceled by President Carter. Okay, he canceled Clinch River, realizing that it was very experimental. Uh, two two breeders had melted. Uh, the first one, EBR one, melted in the fifties. The second one, a commercial one, melted in the sixties. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Carter then said, "Enough is enough." Enough, but uh, so not here. But I'm, I mean, worldwide. Uh... Well, the, the French had the Phoenix, uh, a breeder reactor, uh, and in fact, uh, there was one misguided environmentalist who aimed a bazooka at the uh, Phoenix, huh. uh, just to show how vulnerable uh, the the Phoenix reactor and the Super Phoenix uh, uh, are to to terrorism. And uh, because the fuel is highly enriched, they're shipped right through commercial lanes, and people are very afraid that uh, these reactors could get out of control. In Japan, it's the Manju. In France, it's the Phoenix. And again, these operate on highly enriched fuel, and they can, in fact, sustain supercriticality accidents rather easily. So there are two of them? 
Uh, several uh, that uh, are uh, in the commercial domain. Other, other small countries may, may be doing this experimentally, but those are the two most famous, uh, the Super Phoenix in France and the Manju in Japan. That's amazing. Um, I had no idea these things were going on. I thought it was all just in the lab, that there were not commercial. There was not commercial application yet for breeders. I, I don't know why I believe that, but I did. Well, the one in Japan is still, of course, ongoing. However, the point here is that uh, these, these guys are hot rodders. Uh, they're, they're cowboys. And they build these damn things, and they want to commercialize them and put them in people's backyards. Uh, even though basic basic meltdown and basic supercritical super quality tests have not been done on these on these uh, reactors. You know, we uh, you know, airplanes have crashed. We have lots of experience on crashed airplanes. We have very little experience on crashed reactors. Right. And as a consequence, one of these reactors has been out of control. It's the feet of your pants. Actually, I've seen a couple of 60 Minutes pieces on Chernobyl, and they're pretty grim. I mean, they, they built this, uh, this sarcophagus uh, around it, and that appears to be, according to reports I've seen, deteriorating, and I've right. heard some pretty grim things. Yeah. That every time it rains, every time it rains in Kiev, water seeps into the concrete sarcophagus and moderates the neutrons, as they're called, and you can actually see radiation levels rise. <laughs> it's actually in a working reactor in totally melted form, rising and falling with the rainfall. What's, what's the deal with Chernobyl? I mean, how long are we going to have to deal with this damn mess anyway? Perhaps centuries. And, you know, it's still melting. The action hasn't stopped at all. The laws of physics keep on going. No, I Very hot core. It's melting through the concrete. And at a certain point, it'll go right through the concrete. Then what? And then it'll hit groundwater. And then, you know, there's a concern that it could cause a steam explosion. And like I said, you can actually see neutron levels rise every time it rains and water seeps into the uh, into the sarcophagus. Uh, the geometry of the core is unknown. We do not know what the geometry of the core is. So just like at Fermi One, we have melted fuel in an unknown geometrical configuration. If it concentrates, if it concentrates in one area, you could have supercriticality, not like a Hiroshima bomb but more like what happened to Louis Slotin and the Harry Dagley in 45 and 46. And uh, then you would have uh, heating, then perhaps a steam explosion, which would blow the whole thing apart. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that uh, is still of concern, that the reactor is unstable. All right, assuming it does go on and melt down, um, speaking now Chernobyl, to the groundwater and you get a steam explosion, what kind of magnitude and results from that would we expect? Uh, this would be catastrophic in the sense that all the fission products, all the waste, the nuclear waste, would then be shot into the sky. And then it's fine dust. Uh, the winds would then blow it downwind and uh, contaminate large areas. Now, the greatest nuclear accident of all time before Chernobyl actually took place in Russia uh, under, um, in the 1950s in, in uh, the Ural Mountains. It was the greatest nuclear catastrophe of all time, and it too was hushed up. Um, all these, by the way, all these accidents have been hushed up. What uh, happened there? Well, in the area called Christian, near the village of Kosli, there was a plutonium dump. Uh, Stalin had all the excess plutonium from the nuclear uh, program dumped into this one site. Uh -huh. And apparently, uh, again, supercriticality was achieved and boiling occurred uh, within the plutonium dump. And an explosion took place that blew the lid, blew the lid right off the container. And uh, plutonium in liquid aerosol form shot into the atmosphere. And um, the CIA knew that a big one had happened in Russia. Yes. Because all of a sudden, in the literature, I remember muted reports of this. I That's right. The CIA was onto it. Uh, what happened was, in the journals, scientific journals, the Russians were all of a sudden writing reports about the transport of plutonium through, uh, you know, aqueous environments. Yeah. That is, contaminated lakes. Right. And people said, why would the Russians contaminate their own lakes? Right. With plutonium. This right. is outrageous. 